You're listening to the Generational Wealth Through Commercial Real Estate Podcast. Your host, Will Smith, is a former NFL player that found his passion in commercial real estate. Every week, you will learn from industry experts everything you need to know to get started investing in commercial real estate to build generational wealth. Hey, thank you for tuning in to the Generational Wealth Through Commercial Real Estate Show. I got a very special guest lined up for you today. He's a broker. But before we get into it, um, if you're watching the show for the first time, do me a favor, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Um, you know, I want to keep growing this audience as much as possible. And, you know, if you've been watching this show and, and it's been adding value to your life, do me a favor and leave me an honest review. These reviews are how I'm able to keep bringing on rock star guests like I have today. All right. Housekeeping is out of the way. Today's show guest is Barry Wolf. He's a, a broker with Marcus and Millchap, and he's been in the brokerage industry for over 19 years. So, you know, he, he has a lot of knowledge, a lot of wisdom that he's about to share with us. Hey, Barry, man, we appreciate you coming on the show today. Oh, thanks, Willie. It's, uh, thanks so much for having me. So now I'm excited about it. Uh, absolutely, man. So, so tell us your story. Uh, well, first off, how, how did you get into real estate? Um, I was an attorney before getting into the broker side. So I went to law school, was an attorney for about eight years. And in that time, I was in commercial real estate. I was uh, worked with a lot of real estate developers, some national restaurant chains. I always say it, it kind of dates me, but back then on the development side, I was working with a number of developers that were doing both Kmart and Walmart deals, which yeah. back then they were kind of neck and neck. They were the two you know, 800 pound gorillas. So again, that kind of dates me to show, you know, Kmart was really big back then. <laughs> right, Things right. have obviously changed. Walmart's gone way ahead and Kmart's kind of in the grave now. So yeah. I also worked with a lot of restaurant chains and I went in-house and ran the legal real estate department for Aaron's Inc., which is a New York stock exchange public company, a retailer. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of always been in retail. And when I got into the brokerage business, decided to stay in retail and have been, you know, focused on retail properties, selling shopping centers and single tenant net lease properties. Um, we did that all over the country. Yeah. So I've been yeah. kind of on the retail side since about 93 in reality. Nice, nice, nice. So, so you've seen, you know, some up economies and you've seen some down economies. Um, so, you know, on that note, where, where do you, where do you kind of see the economy that we're in now with COVID? It's interesting. So yeah, I've been through, you know, multiple cycles, you know, several recessions and, you know, several boom cycles. Yeah. It's interesting. We're in a really weird time right now. And I'm kind of been referring to some, it's like a bifurcated economy. If you're asking just what's the economy like right now, I mean, you yeah. see, the stock market's near an all-time high. It's you know falling back a little bit here in the last week or two, but it's at an yeah. all, you know, darn near an all-time high. Well, we're in the midst of a recession. You've got folks that are really you know struggling to pay their rent, struggling to pay utility bills, and you know having a really really hard time. That you've had layoffs with they were maybe in the service-based businesses. So yeah, again, it's really I hate it that it feels like we're. It, our economy right now is really haves and have nots. And it's, right. I, I, I don't like where we're at right now in a lot of ways in that regard. And I don't mean that from a political stance at all, Yeah. Uh, but we really do have a lot of people really hurting and a lot of people that are, you know, out there looking for opportunities and, and doing really well. I mean, anytime there's challenges, you do have folks that seize upon that and do well. Yeah. And it's the same way in retail right now. I mean, you've got a lot of retailers that are really, really struggling and have had hard times and you've got, other brands that are out there chasing opportunities and are, and are growing aggressively. Um, yeah. so it's, it's probably similar to what it always is, but it feels like it's even a little bit more extreme right now. Right, right, right. For sure. Um, give me one second, man. Sure. Record. Hey, we were talking as far as the economy. Yeah. 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 So we just finished the economy up. Um, so, you know, with, with that being said, um, you know, Retail has, like you said, it's, it's transformed a lot, you know, with especially online happening yeah. with your, your Amazons out there and everything, what they're doing to, to disrupt the industry. Uh, but, you know, retail is still alive as well because you, you have your, your uh, nail salons, barbershops, you know, places like that. I, I wouldn't got a haircut today. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get Amazon to come to my house and, and cut my hair for me. So, right. you know. So tell me, man, what do you what do you see the retail industry, um, you know, going moving forward? I'm bullish overall. I mean, there's certainly an evolution going on. I mean, as you said, Amazon is online is the 800 pound gorilla of the e-commerce world. But at the same time, I mean, Target and Walmart in particular uh, are putting 
see tremendous investments into the online business, looking to grow that to frankly compete with Walmart. Yeah. Uh, they also have the advantage, obviously, of having thousands of stores across the country. They yeah. can use as kind of last mile distribution or buy online, pick up in store. Yeah. I, I'm bullish on retail. I mean, they're going to be retailers that struggle. They're going to be retailers that don't make it through the cycle. A lot of them were overwhelmed with debt or had too heavy of debt loads. Mm -hmm. But in reality, I mean, even Amazon is an example. I mean, Amazon is opening stores. I mean, they bought Whole Foods. They're opening you know, in other grocery stores. I mean, I think Amazon is only going to grow their their brick and mortar presence. Yeah. It's really, really difficult for any retailer to have an online only profitable storefront per se. Yeah. So I, I think brick and mortar is here to stay. I don't think it's going anywhere. I mean, I think evolution is important and the brands that evolve and uh, continue to change are gonna be the ones that excel. But I, I don't think retail itself or brick and mortar retail is going away by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. If anything, it's gonna continue growing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, you know, you, you do the retail with the strip centers, but you also do the, you know, the single tenant triple net lease stuff as well. So, I mean, the, the people that's listening to this show, man, they, they never heard of this stuff. So could you just kind of break down, you know, the differences between them and what it all means? Yeah, well, we, so the, the multi-tenant centers, so we saw a lot of shopping centers largely in kind of Florida because mm -hmm. uh, it's a little bit more regional base. And those are, you know, generally those are, it's like what you do with multifamily. They're management intensive. Uh, you can hire a property manager just like you can hire a property manager for a multifamily building. Yep. But a lot of the owners, they own their properties, they manage their properties. Uh, you know, you're dealing with tenants coming and going. You're dealing with rent renegotiations, particularly in days like this. You yep. got vacancies coming that you have to backfill. So it's certainly more management intensive. And then the more passive area, I quit it to kind of the bond portion of the real estate portfolio are these single tenant properties that you see you know, unless you live in Dan downtown Manhattan or some other inner city area, as you're driving around, you see the Taco Bells, you see the convenience stores, you see the yeah. banks, the drug stores, all these single tenant you know, properties with the, the brands you recognize that dot all over where we live. Generally, those are owned by an investor a lot of times. Uh, it could yeah. be a neighbor of yours. Well, that's where most people don't realize it's not you know, CVS that owns that location or Taco Bell that owns that location. It's probably some investor just like you and I. Yeah, uh, they're buying it for cash flow. It's called you know passive investment mailbox money, yeah. where they you know if it's really true triple net we call it, where the tenant you know, pays the taxes, they pay the insurance, they maintain the building. If the roof ever need, needs to get replaced or a storm blows through, the tenant does all that work. They maintain the property, and you as an owner, you just collect a rent check every month that either comes in the mail or shows up by you know direct deposit. Uh, so it's really a great way to own real estate as a yeah. truly passive investment in reality. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, on those lines, you know, which one is better, you know, would you say that the strip center is better or, or the triple net is better when you, you, you know, you find that where you don't have to do anything but collect the check. I don't think there's a right. I don't think there is one that's better really. I think a lot of it, just like saying, you know, with multifamily, what's better, you know, is it better to own a multifamily or retail? Is it better to own a duplex or a, 50 unit building. It's just, yeah. I think it's just a lot depends on stage of life right. and also the economics. I mean, you have, you know, shopping centers at times can be, you know, lower price or they can be bigger too. Yeah. I think a lot of it's just lifestyle and stage of life. I mean, the, the shopping center, just like again, the apartment building is much more management intensive. Yeah. So you tend to see folks that are willing to roll up their sleeves. Maybe they want to add some value and they're looking to you know, buy something and you know, again, get vacancies filled and, they bought it for two million. They can do some work on it and yeah, make sure they could sell it in a couple of years for four million. Yeah. Um, so that's somebody who's a little bit more in, actively involved. Yeah. Whereas the net lease property, it tends to be somebody who's kind of transitioned out of that type of property. They used to own something that was more management intensive, whether that be an apartment building or an office building or a, a shopping center. Yeah. And now they're in the stage of life where they're looking for just this again, this more passive cash flow. They right. want to be able to go enjoy their lives at that stage, go on go on vacation, just kick back and not have any anything they got to worry about and just have the income coming in. The right. returns do tend to be a little bit lower. It's kind of that old adage, risk versus reward. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's more secure, typically considered, and there's less work involved. So therefore, they're typically lower returns. Yeah. But if you've gotten to that stage where you built up that, you know, that income, that nest egg, yeah. you can take a little bit less cash flow. Right. So that's probably right. the biggest difference. So there's no, again, there's no right or wrong, really. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's definitely a good point. 
Now, you know, you've been in this, this, this game for 19 years and you've seen a lot of investors work with a lot of groups. Um, and the multifamily side, I, I work with a lot of multifamily, um, you know, value add investors. You know, what are, what are some of the ways that uh, you can add value to a strip center to increase the value of it? I think a strip center, the easiest would be, you know, let's say you buy a building that's got 20% vacancy, you, you fill the vacancies. So that'd be the easiest way is buy something with vacancies and fill it. Mm-hmm. Another way uh, on the strip center side, again, it's probably very similar to multifamily. You buy a property and the rents are just low. It's, you, you've got it, maybe it's a long-term owner where they've owned it for many years and they've gotten just like, you know, just like you get comfortable in a multifamily building, they don't want to lose tenants. So they haven't really pushed the rent. So maybe they're in a $25 a foot market, yeah. but they've kept their rents at $16 a foot because the tenants have been there a long time. They've owned it a long time. And again, they don't want to risk losing a tenant. So yeah. the rents are really low. Whereas you've got an opportunity to come in as a buyer and buy that. And you know, whether it's slowly or maybe quickly yeah. uh, move those rents to, to market, depending on the lease terms and lease structures. I and mean, if the tenants all have 10 year leases, you may not be able to do that. But if you've yeah. got a center where you've got short term leases or month to month leases, yeah. you come in and move those to the market. So those would be the two quickest ways. Another way would be, you buy a property that's kind of gotten run down. So maybe the rents are low because the property is run down. So you buy it and you, you renovate it. You add, yeah. you know, add value that way. Again, just like what you see done, your clients do, they renovate it. They, you know, they redo the cabinets or add in new flooring. So here you add a new facade, a new roof. So the roof's not leaking and new signage, re, you know, repave the parking lot. So it looks great. So you yeah. just, you know, that way you're able to push the rent. So that'd be on the, multi, on the multi-tenant side, those would be a few ways that you're able to potentially, you know, add some value. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, um, that's, that's definitely great points there. Um, now, you know, the people, like I said, the first, this is the first time my listeners are hearing about, um, you know, investing in retail. So tell them how, how do you evaluate, you know, a property? What is the property worth? How do you come up with that valuation? So I think a lot of it is particularly on the single tenant side or even on the multi multi tenant side, to me, at first, it starts with the real estate. Um, you got to look at what's the quality of the real estate look like. Yeah. Because uh, if that's not good, then there's probably going to always be challenges. If it's you know not located on a you know a corridor that has much traffic or it's got crummy visibility, if it's got challenges that you just can't correct, yeah. Um, I think that's something that could be a red flag. So to me, it starts with the real estate, yep. and then secondarily looking at the tenancy. I mean, who are your tenants? Uh, what's the credit look like? Think of it's a single tenant property, uh, the lease structure, how long a lease term do they have? What's their credit look like? How do they perform at that particular location? So those would be a few ways, again, not that dissimilar than, you know, than what you do, but I think it's really real estate first and foremost, and kind of taking, yeah. I kind of take like a macro to micro approach where you're looking at uh, yeah, you know, what's the location? Maybe what's the state look like? What do the taxes look like in that particular area? And yep. then kind of getting more micro to, you know, what city are you in and where in the, where in that city are you? And then ultimately, you know, what, where's the exact site and what's that look like? What's the access? What's the visibility? Yep. Those sort of things. And, you know, is it a property that you're going to be able to keep, keep occupied and, you know, yep. keep pushing your rents upwards? Yeah. Yeah. Now you, you mentioned something here that I, I know it probably went over a lot of people's head where you you said the credit of a tenant, you're not really talking about their personal FICO score. You mean the actual business itself, right? Exactly. Whether that's a, fran- you know, if it's a franchisee uh, or if it's a, co- you know, if it's a public company, you can pull up their annual report and see, you know, how are they trending? Maybe see what's their stock been doing, how much cash is on the balance sheet. But it's a private company, correct. Neither fi- individual FICO store, although uh, if there's a personal guarantee, it might be that. You yeah. know, looking what are their per- personal financials certainly look like. But otherwise, if it's a larger franchisee, again, looking at the P&L, looking at their balance sheet, how much cash do they have on hand? How have they yeah. been doing you know, nowadays? How have they been doing during COVID? And right. you know, normal times, just how have their sales been trending? So those yeah. sort of things, just trying to get a gauge as to how do their economics look overall and you know, how yeah. strong do they look to survive going forward? Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's a really good point because you know, there could be two properties that have triple net leases on them. If one is a dollar general, you know, that one's going to be a strong credit profile right. tenant. But if you have somebody that's a startup <laughs> trying to get their first, uh, you know, year in the business, even though it's triple net, it's not as valuable to you because, you know, it's a lot of risk associated with that tenant that's in there, right? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's where I mean, the cap rate will come into play. It's kind of that risk versus reward, the, yep. you know, the higher the risk. So that mom and pop, let's say you talk about there, you know, there's a new franchisee or they're starting their own business. That's going to be at a much higher cap rate than, as you said, a dollar general, that's a 15 year triple net lease with an investment grade tenant that's growing and their stock's doing fantastic. So no, I, that absolutely. Those would be kind of the two extremes of the spectrum, but, but certainly, so you're looking again at, you know, even like a Taco Bell is an example. I mean, just because you you drive by a Taco Bell, is that a you know, four unit operator? Or is it a 344 unit operator? And what do their financials look like? And how much experience do they have? How do their sales do? So even even that scenario, just the the flag on the the sign isn't necessarily enough to to look at it either. Uh, so you got to really yeah. dig into who's my tenant ultimately. Yeah. No, that's 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 a really good point. And. Um... You know, something that people that, that doesn't, you know, if they're not doing it on a daily basis as far as looking at these opportunities, then that's stuff that they're not going to think about. So, you know, that's the importance of having somebody like a Barry Wolf on your team that can, you know, point you in the right direction because, you know, this is a lot of money you're throwing out there. Oh, yeah. And those are the things we do. I mean, we work with a lot of buyers, particularly in 1031 exchanges, which is where they've sold one property to transition another property and you're looking to defer the taxes. Is yeah. really doing that is looking to understand what are they looking to accomplish, what's important to them, what kind of security is important, and then looking at lots and lots of deals and you know all the factors we've talked about and trying to evaluate. Let's whittle that list of hundreds and hundreds of properties that are out there to three or four or five that might be the right fit for each and each, that particular person and, and work for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, okay, so and that that brings me to the next point, man. Is um. You know, somebody that's wanting to get started in this um, this space, you know, of retail investing, mm -hmm. you know, what is the best way for them to find deals? You know, because, you know, on the multifamily side, you can, you know, almost drive around and find deals. But obviously, you know, you go into brokers as well. But, you know, from the retail side, what are you seeing? I think it's probably similar. I think it's working with a good broker, ideally. I mean, even like you said, multifamily. Yeah, you can drive around and see buildings, but nobody puts a for sale sign in front right. of their 20 unit apartment building. Right. So you really need to be tuned into, you know, somebody like you that's eating, sleeping, breathing, and you know what's happening and you know what deals are out there and what's on the market. And it's the same thing here. I mean, it's all we do is work in these sort of properties. So we're, we know the developers, we know guys that are out there doing deals. So a lot of times we're able to find deals off market or lightly marketed, or even if they're on the market, what's available and yeah. you know, what, what are the better opportunities out there? So I think it's, you know, finding a really good broker, this is all they do. And, you know, just like, like with you on the multifamily side, you know, work with somebody that's all they do and right. you know, work with an expert that's out there able to help you and hopefully try to avoid the mistakes. Yeah. Like yeah. you said, the money, it's so hard to make, you know, the money we're talking about. I mean, you go buy one of these buildings or these properties, you're talking hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars and, uh, we don't take lightly. I mean, that's, uh, you know, you want to help somebody make sure that that grows and doesn't go, go in reverse. I mean, you don't want to lose yeah. that principle for sure. Yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. Um, all right. So, so, I mean, what, what advice would you give to an investor that's trying to do his first deal? Um, you know, he, he want to make a smart investment, but you know, at the same time, he doesn't have $10 million to go take down a yeah. deal. So what, what advice would you give him? I get, I probably get back to looking at the location and, you know, buying good real estate that whether it's a single tenant property or a shopping center, that if it's really good real estate, you'll be able to backfill it. Um, you'll be able to find a replacement tenant again, whether it's single tenant or multi-tenant, you'll find those replacement tenants. If it's a you know high traffic corridor, you know, solid demographics for those tenants. Um, that'd be the first and foremost. It's just, it gets back to the old adage. What's important is, it's location, 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 as opposed yeah. to, you know, you brought up Dollar General. I mean, going and buying, you know, a DG, which I'm, I'm actually a big fan of Dollar General, but we're really, really selective of the locations. Yeah. Some of these are in really tertiary markets. And if they ever vacate, right. it may not be a replacement tenant. You may have paid a million and a half, $2 million for a property. And, you know, whenever that lease comes due, if they leave, it's, it could be in such a small market. There's just nobody to backfill it. Yep. That'd be the first thing I think is just really look into the quality of the real estate, the location. And again, if, if you've got good real estate, you can probably correct mistakes you make elsewhere. Even if you overpaid, yeah. if you've got really good real estate, eventually the market will catch up to you. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's both uh, from a, from a, 
from a wise, wise agent that's been in the business a long time. So <laughs> long time. <laughs> <laughs> good deal. Good deal. All right, man. Well, let's go ahead and segue to the last segment of the show. It's a lightning round. A couple questions sure. for you here. Sure. All right. What's the best advice you've ever been given? Um, I just to work hard. Uh, actually, I'll take the, I, I'll say this. I mean, I was, uh, you'll relate to this. I was at, um, basketball camp as a kid. And I actually did a post on this on LinkedIn. I was probably 12 years old, 12, 13 years old. And it was a university of Georgia basketball camp. And I can still picture sitting there on the court with a couple hundred other you know, um, campers there. And the head coach of uh, the university of Georgia basketball program back then, Hugh Durham was talking to us. And it's funny, the things you remember, I don't remember anything else he said, yeah. but he made this statement. He told the story. He said, I always, again, you'll equate to this. He said, I always told my players like, you need to go practice your free throws. You need to be making a hundreds of free throws every single day. And the players would look at him. And he's like, coach, I got, I got school. We got practice, obviously. I got my buddies to hang out with. I got my girlfriend to hang out with. When the hell am I going to find time to shoot hundreds of free throws every day? Right, right. And he looked at him. He said, his statement was always, there's two six o'clocks in every day. Mm. And that always resonated with me. It's like, if you can't do it at 6 p.m., do it at 6 a.m. The gym's open. Go get a key to the gym and go do your free throws then. Yeah. It's the same thing now for what we do. It's not free throws. Maybe it's reading or it's studying the business or you know, seeing what's out there or doing proposals or talking with people. So yeah. if you can't do it at 6 p.m., do it at 6 a.m. And you know, so that's, just, that's probably you know, maybe the, the advice that's just stuck with me yeah. my entire life. And it's kind of changed how I work and it's made it where – I'm an early riser. I'm usually up by 4 5 o'clock. And again, it's stuff that I can't do other times of the day. I'll do it when people aren't bugging me at 4 30 a.m. Yep. 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 No, nah, that's, that's, uh, that's great advice. Uh, best book you've read this year. Um, I'm reading it right now. I've got a couple books. I, I don't read a ton of books. I try to more like who are a couple authors and a couple books that really resonate with me and in my yeah. business and, and really, read and reread them a couple of times. One I'm going yeah. to be going back through is The Compound Effect yeah. uh, by Darren Hardy. I've done his uh, insane productivity program. I get his, he does uh, daily emails that are really, really good. I recommend. Yeah. Uh, so that's a good book. And it talks about, again, something you'd rec- resonate with as an athlete, just the little things you do in life, those small little incremental changes. Yeah. How do you improve you know, a fraction of 1% every day? Right. That over the course of a year, if you improve you know, a quarter of a percent every single day, you'll look back 365 days later or 720 days later and realize, holy cow, that, that little teeny tiny incremental change that yeah. is hard to even recognize a year, two years, 10 years down the road, you realize it really compounded right. and made a tremendous difference in my, my business and my life. Yeah, yeah. No, nah, that's, that's a great book. And I, I got the audio version, so I you know, listen to it often. Um, I did. Same thing, actually. I got the audio version. Yep, <laughs> yep. Same thing. That's All cool. Right. Do, you do, um, daily, do you do his Darren Daily video, audio videos? No, I don't. I need to sign up for that. Yeah, so sign up for those. They're fantastic. And again, along those lines of just like daily improvement, uh, they're like three, four minute videos just talking about something in life. And yep. I, I highly recommend those to anybody that's out there. Yeah, yeah. Definitely checking that out. And they're um, free, by the way. Yeah, that's even better. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what, what are some rituals that you've created that's making you a better uh, person or investor in general? I just reading um, on a daily basis, uh, whether that's, again, like the book we're talking about or other books, uh, yep. trade publications, things for my business. Um, just every day reading 30 minutes, an hour, uh, setting that aside. I mean, you see so many people that They'll, you know, they go binge watching things on Netflix or yeah, watching yeah. a couple hours of TV a day that if you spend that time, at least a chunk of it, reading and studying whatever it is your business is, um, again, you'll see that incremental you know, knowledge you, you gain and it'll improve your business and, and your life instead of just kind of sitting there watching garbage on TV every day. Right, right. And this question kind of lines up with the last one, um, but maybe you have something different you want to add to it. Okay. What is one thing you're doing to help you improve your business today? Um, I'd say uh, talking with people on a regular basis like you, honestly. I mean, uh, active on LinkedIn, uh, talking with different people every day, seeing different ideas, new approaches. So I think that as much as anything, just seeing instead of kind of tunnel vision where I just think I'm automatic, I'm doing things right, I'm doing it the best way. 
yeah. always kind of keeping an eye out what are other people doing and what, you know, even in other industries, what are they doing that yeah. maybe I've not thought of or we're not doing that it might be a fit and might help you down the road. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you can give your younger self one tip in regards to investing, what would that be? Um, start early, I guess. Uh, that's probably something I wish I could go back in. I mean, like you've done and you see, I mean, in multifamily or in, you know, in commercial, even what we do, I mean, just buying you, almost anybody, unless it's generational and you happen to be so fortunate to be a second or third generation, Yeah. you start small. I mean, it might be buying a, uh, buying a single family house or buying a duplex that you then rent one side of and you live on one side and then maybe yeah. you move up and you buy a fourplex and you still live there and you rent out three of them. So I think just smart at starting, starting small. And, you know, again, we talk about the compound effect compounding and yeah. just doing that in over time, over a 30, 40 year career. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big believer of the 30 year overnight success, um, yep. sort of winning the lottery nobody makes a lot of money overnight. It's yeah. generally, even the folks you look at, it's like, holy cow, how'd they get so successful? They seem, yeah, they got lucky or they did it you know, quickly. Yeah. It's almost always that 20, 30, 40 year overnight success. While, the, you, right. while you think they all of a sudden hit it big, yeah. what you don't realize is they've been back there busting their butt for 20, 30, 40 years. Again, you know, like you did as an athlete, it didn't, yeah. it didn't happen overnight. You didn't all of a sudden show up one day and get to the NFL. I mean, right. You right. did that for your some from Pee Wee football to till you know through high school through college. It took working your tail off every single day in practice and yep. times you you probably rather have been out there with your buddies and they were partying and having a good time, but you were about yeah. there sweating sweating your tail off in practice and right. getting drilled by your coaches. Absolutely, absolutely. Now you you're right. You one hundred percent right there. Um, what's the worst job you ever had? I don't. Um, Really no bad ones. I mean, I've learned things that at all of them. I mean, I remember, you know, working at the mall, making cheesesteaks that, you know, I don't, I don't think I'd want to be doing it now at 52 years old, but as a <laughs> right. 16 year old, that wasn't the worst thing in the world. And you, and you yeah. learn from that. If nothing else, you learn, you don't want to be doing that the rest of your life. It's so. <laughs> right, right. fortunate. I've never had a really bad boss. I've never had a job. I, I felt like I had to get away from or get out of. So really I can't, not, I can't say anything particular that I, yeah. I hated doing and I didn't learn something from at least. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Always learning, so that's good. Yeah. Um, last question for you. Your rich uncle just left you a, a million dollars tax-free. What are you doing with it? Um, probably looking at you know, some different investing, maybe put that in some different real estate investments. Maybe it's through a fund or trying to find a one-off deal, probably something like that. Yeah, uh, and probably would. Yeah, you know, in that scenario, probably would donate, you know, a chunk of it to some different causes that you yeah. know are important to me or important to him, and yeah, uh, that could help people also. Probably do that for part of it as well. Yeah, yeah, awesome, awesome. Well, Barry, that's the end of the show, man. Uh, tell my listeners how can they get in touch with you. Probably best way is just on LinkedIn. I'm active, just like you are. That's how you and I met. Uh, yeah. Active on there, so look me up on on LinkedIn, and happy to connect and. If I can ever help anybody out there, you know, give me a shout through one of my posts or a DM, direct message, and you know, welcome connecting with most anybody. Awesome. Awesome. Appreciate you coming on the show today, man. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. It's been fun. Absolutely. Thanks, Willie. Thank you for listening to the Generational Wealth Through Commercial Real Estate Podcast, brought to you by Onyx Capital Investments. Onyx Capital Investments works with investors nationwide to invest in income-producing real estate in emerging markets. Connect online at www.onyxcapitalinvestments.com to learn more about what we are doing. If we have added value to your life, please leave us a review. Thank you.